The next business is the election of Speaker. The Honourable Member for Karangamite. Clerk, uh, I propose that Mr Andrew do take the chair of this House as Speaker. Is the proposal seconded? The Honourable Member for Mallee. Mr Clerk, I have a great deal of delight in seconding that proposition. Does the Honourable Member for Wakefield accept the nomination? I'm honoured too, Mr Clerk. Is there any further proposal? There being no further proposal, the time for proposals has expired. I declare the honourable member proposed. Mr Andrew has been elected as speaker. I wish to express my grateful thanks to the House for the high honour it has been pleased to confer upon me. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I on behalf of the government, and I know that I will speak uh, on perhaps on this one occasion on behalf of the entire House, uh, extend very warm congratulations to you. The House has made an excellent choice. Uh, you are a person who is widely regarded in this House. You are regarded as a person of deep commitment to your electorate, a person who deals honestly and candidly with people. You bring to the office of Speaker uh, a long parliamentary history, having entered the parliament in the 1983 election as the member for Wakefield. You've previously served uh, as chief government whip and in a variety of other positions um, within the coalition parties. The position of Speaker is a very important one. It's a difficult role. The robust nature of parliamentary debate in the Australian tradition ensures that it will always be a difficult role. Let me say on behalf of the government that uh, uh, we will support uh, very, very much um, any attempts you make to bring greater civility and dignity to the proceedings of the parliament. Uh, we naturally expect robust debate. It is the Australian tradition and people who imagine that you can have debates in this parliament that are free of... Uh, uh, very strong and on occasions acrimonious exchange uh, are misunderstanding completely the character of this chamber. But I do think there is within the Australian community a desire, where appropriate, for higher levels of civility in parliamentary behaviour. Now, I have a responsibility, the members of the government have a responsibility to contribute to that. The Leader of the Opposition has a responsibility and the members of the Opposition have a responsibility to contribute to that. But you come to this very high office, this very important political and parliamentary office, you come to it with one very great commodity, and that is you have the respect of your colleagues. And respect is the golden commodity in public life, and you bring to this office that golden commodity, and it's an excellent start. I wish you well. I congratulate you. It is properly a source of great personal satisfaction to you and your family. I wish you well. You'll do it well. You'll have our goodwill and you'll have our support. Thank you, Prime Minister. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, Mr Speaker, can I join the Prime Minister in congratulating you and agree with almost everything that the Prime Minister said <laughs> in the remarks that he made? Uh, he did speak on this occasion for the whole House. I, I speak on this occasion for the largest party in this House. And, um, and uh, we... Uh, we are pleased to see you in that position. We, uh, we see you. <laughs> 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 
We, um, the reason why uh, we chose uh, we chose not to oppose you uh, for was uh, were many and varied. Uh, not least of the reasons was because of the parliamentary service to which the Prime Minister referred. It is always pleasing to those of us who have been in this parliament for a while, and I suspect too for those who recently joined it, to see somebody who is diligent in his, work, his or her work in the House, who represents the parliament effectively on parliamentary delegations, who devotes themselves to detailed committee work, who has the understanding of his peers uh, that uh, allows him to be appointed to a position such as Chief Government Whip, is accorded the high office of Speaker ultimately uh, as an accolade and a level of confidence that that person knows the procedures of the House, the spirit of the place, knows the, uh, the attitudes, the foibles, the difficulties, the, uh, uh, the problems that are going to beset a person in that office and uh, we have confidence that, uh, that you understand all those things and therefore uh, that, as I said, is one of the reasons that we, choose not to, we chose not to oppose you. We also, however, note that you come with uh, a chequered background in terms of your predecessors in relation to the last chamber. Uh, it was the Prime Minister's uh, earnest good faith at the beginning of the last parliament to see an independent speaker emerge. We still share uh, that uh, desire on this side of the chamber, uh, but it is yet to be demonstrated as far as, the other side, as far as the other side is concerned. You will recollect on occasions, no doubt, uh, the, uh, the stands that we were obliged to take in defence of Speaker Halverson at uh, different points of time. But we, uh, we do note we do note that despite all his vicissitudes and the fact that he found it impossible to sustain his independence to the end, at least he has uh, ended up as uh, ambassador to Ireland. And uh, it reminded me of, uh, of Disraeli on his uh, elevation to the peerage. Uh, one of his uh, colleagues, said, after long service in the House of Commons, uh, asked him what it felt like being elevated to the peerage, and he said, well, I'm dead dead but in Elysian fields. And, uh, I suspect the same applies to, to uh, Mr Halverson now. There, of course, has been another speaker since that point of time, a, a speaker whom many of us liked uh, but got to that position not uh, necessarily because of a decision to uphold the independence of the place. And, uh, his, and his fate, of course, was to lose a pre-selection in, uh, in the course of it. So those are the two precedents before you on independence. On the other occasion when I congratulated the speaker here, I, I quoted the words which we all know in this chamber from the person who actually defined the role of speakership for, in the Westminster system, Speaker Lenthal. When Speaker Lenthal stood in, or sat in Parliament and the King's men approached him and asked for the whereabouts of a number of recalcitrant members of Parliament, and he responded, of course, I have neither eyes to see nor mouth to speak nor ears to hear except as the parliament directs me. And uh, he was uh, a courageous definer of the office at a point of time when there was no clear cut division between the executive and the parliament and no clear determination of the rights of the two in relation to each other. And it was about indeed to be tested in civil war. I, uh, looked into Speaker Lenthal shortly, uh, understanding that you would be here, to see how he ended up uh, after all those years of diligent uh, definition. He ended up dead, basically. <laughs> <coughs> it was how he ended up. The, uh, the King's men finally got him. Uh, but I, uh, he was accused unfairly, basically, of being a regicide, and I thought it was worth, uh, worth just quoting from his uh, confession uh, to the Vicar of Whitney, uh, who was later Bishop of Chichester, and he said, I confess with Saul I held their clothes while they murdered him. But herein I was not so criminal as Saul was, for God thou knowest I never consented to his death. I ever prayed and endeavoured what I could against it, but I did too much, almighty God, forgive me. He then went on to say, three things are especially laid to my charge, where indeed I am too guilty. And I went from the parliament to the army and I proposed the bloody question for trying the king and that I sat after the king's death. 
and he goes on to talk about Presbyterians, which, given the church service that we held this morning, would not be appropriate to me to quote from. But uh, he did say, say this. The second excuse, he goes on, can be made, but I have the king's pardon, and I hope Almighty God will show me his mercy also. Yet, sir, even then, when I put the question—that was the question on the king's death— I hope the very putting the question would have cleared him, because I believed four for one were against it, but they deceived me also. Now, that's an important lesson on comprehending the numbers in the house <laughs> <laughs> before, you, uh, before you are to, uh, to put a question before us. But then he goes on to the third, I make this candid confession, that it was my own baseness and cowardice and unworthy fear to submit my life and estate to the mercy of those men that murdered the king that hurried me on against my own conscience to act with them. Yet then I thought also I might do some good and hinder some ill. Well, he, he did indeed establish a proud record, but uh, less proud in his death. He asked that there be only one subscription on his tomb uh, as he departed, and it was the inscription, Vermis Sum. I'm no Latin scholar. In fact, I know no Latin at all, but I'm told by those who are that what that means is I am a worm. That is, uh, however, not to be your fate. <laughs> we, um, actually, in one, sense, in one sense, it is to be the fate of all of us, but uh, it, in another sense, I don't think it is to be your, uh, your fate as Speaker in this chamber. Let, let me just say in conclusion that we accept the view, we accept the view that uh, you are stand there as an independent arbiter of the affairs here, and it is the duty of all of us to assist you in that charge. We note the fate that has been there before you, and uh, we will be encouraging the government, uh, as the Prime Minister admonished and encouraged us, to ensure that you have every protection in that independence. We note that there were some innovations in relation to supplementary questions, in relation to brevities of answers, and we regard those innovations, of course, as the test of true independence. Thank the Leader of the Opposition. The Speaker, Deputy Prime Minister. Federal Leader of the National Party, I join and congratulate you on the election to this high office. This is a great way to start the 39th Parliament, the unanimous election of our new Speaker, and we wish you well in that challenging role. You, of course, come from South Australia. You are proud of that fact, and you follow in the footsteps of some very colourful former members of this parliament, including one former speaker, Archie Cameron, one stage a member of my party, at one stage a member of uh, a raft of uh, groupings, uh, but uh, a, colourful, uh, a very colourful speaker. I don't necessarily ascribe to you that you follow those footsteps. I simply uh, take the opportunity to wish you well. Also to add that in the presence of the retired member for New England and former speaker, who is on the floor of the chamber at this historic moment. But I know that he would want for me to impart his congratulations to you as we uh, salute the service that he gave as speaker in the last and closing stages of the previous 38th parliament. It is uh, a challenging job, as all occupants of your chair has found over the years. We congratulate you on your election. I recall vividly the proximity we had to share in an experience which had its moments when we travelled on the MV Icebird uh, as part of a public works inspection of Antarctica many years ago, three, four weeks in the one uh, cabin down to uh, base Casey and back. Uh, there's no problem in our cabin. The problem was from the adjoining cabin occupied by Gary Neal when he flooded us out one night. Mr Speaker, Congratulations and good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I remember for Karangamite. Mr Speaker, may I add my uh, congratulations on behalf of all your friends, supporters uh, from Wakefield and family uh, as your proposer. Could I just say it's a historic moment in this parliament that you have been elected Speaker without another candidate. Uh, like yourself, I've been here some 14 years and that has not taken place uh, in my time in this House. Uh, so that uh, speaks well of your uh, impartiality, the respect that you are held by both sides of this House, and augurs well for your, uh, uh, your speakership. You bring to, the, uh, bring to the Parliament, as the member for Wakefield, uh, many qualities, and uh, uh, we all note the, uh, your free trade credentials that uh, Bert Kelly would be so pleased that you, <laughs> that you have brought to this House, and now, of course, you will be uh, impartial in those matters. Um, 
you bring a sense of uh, good cheer, a sense uh, of uh, humour. Uh, you are a man, uh, a man of honour and principle, and Mr. Speaker, I wish you well for a long and distinguished career in your, uh, in your post as Speaker. The Honourable Member for Wannan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I join with the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, the Deputy Prime Minister, and my good friend, the Member for Karangamite? in congratulating you on your election and particularly on being unopposed. I could uh, join with you uh, in taking some of the comments from the Prime Minister. I think uh, they are very, very appropriate. Uh, someone of honesty, someone of integrity, someone who has respect of all members of this chamber. And I have no doubt that uh, you will indeed carry your position with dignity and with civility, and uh, I think the words of the Prime Minister certainly should be heeded by all members when he spoke of the responsibility of all members to help in upholding the standards of this chamber. There is no doubt that you as Speaker will give a lead, but I'm sure that uh, all members realise that there is a responsibility on us to support that. I think it is a very special occasion, particularly as the opposition chose not to nominate someone, and I think that uh, augurs extremely well for your future. It is also very special to me having the member for Wakefield because of uh, some personal connections, and uh, I think uh, you will do great dignity to the electors of Wakefield. One unfortunate point, I think, was while the Leader of the Opposition is to be commended uh, in his support and the fact that uh, the Opposition chose not to nominate someone. It was unfortunate that he then chose to take some critical remarks of your two predecessors, and I thought that was a little unfortunate, particularly considering, considering he, the new speaker has not even had the opportunity. The new speaker Order. has not even had the opportunity to demonstrate the great skills Order. that he will bring with the job. So again, can I congratulate you, and I am sure that you will do a truly outstanding job. The Honourable Member for Cowper. Mr Speaker, I rise to offer you my heartfelt congratulations and I indicate to the House that uh, while I was unopposed in the party room, I will be opposed later this afternoon, but of course I will win, like you. Uh, but I just wanted to say to you that anticipating the events later this day, that I know we will work together as a very effective team. and I. Now, now Darrell, no. I can still make that appointment for you. Order. The member for Cowper <laughs> has the call. Mr Speaker, I just wanted to say congratulations, <laughs> tell you how delighted I am that you have that position and how much I look forward to working closely with you in the ensuing parliament. Honourable members, I seek the indulgence of the House to respond to the gracious remarks made by the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, the member for Karangamite. Wannan and Cowper, and I beg your pardon, the Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> Lady, <laughs> honourable members, when speakers come to the chair with some historic reluctance, and many think it is simply feigned, let me tell you, as someone who stands here now with a great deal of trepidation, that it is not entirely feigned. You do me a great honour in inviting me to take this chair and electing me to it, but with it goes an enormous responsibility. And with the help of all of you, I hope I can discharge that responsibility effectively. I want to respond to both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition for their gracious remarks and the Deputy Prime Minister. I want also to thank the member for Mallee for his preparedness to second my nomination. The member for Mallee and I are electoral neighbours. We have shared many mutual issues and mutual representations to various ministers and I've been grateful for his friendship. But I want particularly, if I might, to single out the member for Karangamite for a special mention. There are those of you who have come to this chamber sworn in today into the 39th parliament for the first time. Let me tell you, in sentiments that will be shared, I believe, by the member for Carayo, that you can ask for no more fearless advocate than the member for Karangamite. The member for Karangamite will be honest with you whether you like it or not. 
but he has this remarkable ability to ensure that people continue to respect him while he's being brutally honest with them. Can I say to you, Member for Karangamite, in this office and in this chair, I will need that quality and that friendship more than I've needed at any other time in the past 14 years. Can I also seek your indulgence to make a personal observation or two? For I have in the gallery the family, and all of you who know me will know that but for the support of my wife Carolyn and our three children, but for the affection that they continue to share on me no matter what I pursue, and but for the constant reassurance that she gives to the four of us, we would not, I would not be here and the family would not be the cohesive unit that it is. So can I express on this public occasion our appreciation particularly to her. I do not have any monopoly on, happily, on happy family life. It's something that most of you are grateful to have had to have experienced at some time and to be experiencing now. Nor do I have any monopoly on the security of uh, parents who were committed to each other and uh, who surrounded all of us in the family with love and affection. I suspect, however, that I share with the Prime Minister and with the Leader of the Opposition the reality of being a child of the 50s who grew up with the traditional Sunday lunch of the 50s, and Sunday lunch in the Andrew House was always either fried parson or fried politician, depending on just how the sermon had run two hours earlier. So I grew up steeped in some sort of philosophic tradition, as I know both the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition did, and as most of you will have as well. Frankly, we come into this place with a great deal more in common than we have dividing us. But all too frequently what the public sees is the political divide rather than the aspirations and the hope for all Australians that we share in common. I will be seeking, as the Prime Minister has alluded to, a great deal more civility in the House. It is inevitable that when two opposing, at least two opposing political uh, perspectives meet, that there will be tension and there will be heated debate, and that's entirely responsible and defensible. What is totally undefensible, totally intolerable, and what the standing orders will do or not allow is the sort of scorn and derision that, from, that sometimes emerges in the heat of the moment. I abhor scorn and derision, and I intend to reinforce the standing orders to ensure that those characteristics do not emerge in the 39th Parliament. I, of course, ran through all the comments that other speakers had made and found that on this occasion they had, had exercised their right to much the same sentiments as I have expressed. So, friends, let me indicate this to you. It is, in fact, not possible to raise the standards of this parliament unless we all genuinely desire that it should happen, unless there is peer group pressure to help make it happen, and unless as individuals we exercise some discipline, some mutual respect and some individual restraint. I come into this chair and want to acknowledge a very happy coincidence. The first occupier of the chair of the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the history of the Parliament of Australia in 1901 was one Sir William Holder, who was also the member for Wakefield. I consider it a very fortunate coincidence that at the end of this uh, century I should be occupying this chair as the present member for Wakefield. South Australia has had a proud tradition of members occupying this chair. As has been mentioned, the members for Macon, uh, the, uh, Mr. Macon, Mr. Maclay, and Mr. Cameron have all had a part in this chair. And I've had the opportunity in 15 years in this place to witness the speakership of Speakers Jenkins, the uh, father of the member for Scullin, Child, Maclay, and Martin. I want to acknowledge their role in exercising an impartial judgment as Speakers of the Parliament. But I want particularly to focus on the speakership of friends of mine in Speakers Halverson and Sinclair. As the Deputy Whip, I work closely with Speaker Halverson. I know him well 
and I believe we would all join in wishing him every success and a long retirement and an appreciation for the role that he played in this parliament. But honourable members, we are here today for a unique glimpse of history because this is the first time that any one of us has sat in this chamber, any one of us, without the presence on the, in the, in the uh, benches of the member for New England, the Right Honourable Ian Sinclair. And so can I say to Ian and to his wife Rosemary, you will be sorely missed from this chamber, Ian. You will be, your role as the Speaker was appreciated. You brought to this chair a presence that no one else can quite hope uh, to repeat in, in any unique way. And in fact, uh, we will miss you enormously. And I hope that the reforms that you so courageously instigated can be continued. Yeah. Honourable members, it's a privilege to be elected as the Speaker of this chamber. But it is an even greater privilege for all of us, myself included, to be here representing electors from 148 electorates across this country. I resolve to do all I can to fairly uphold the standing orders so that those people who have elected you and I will know that they have a voice in this place without fear or favour. Prime Minister. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, I have ascertained that it will be His Excellency the Governor-General's pleasure to receive you, Mr Speaker, in the Members' Hall immediately after the resumption of sittings at 2.30 p.m. Prior to my presentation to His Excellency this afternoon, the bells will ring for five minutes so that honourable members may attend in the chamber and accompany me to the Members' Hall when they may, if they so wish, be introduced to His Excellency. The sitting is suspended until 2.30 p.m. <laughs>